Right on. Thank you so much, Morgan, for that introduction. And thank you to the whole SIG for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I've been very excited about this. And, uh, you know, in true Wadham style, uh, among today's participants, at least three continents are represented. And although this is a SIG for people at the beginning of their career, it's nice to see that um, I'm not alone uh, as far as those of us who are established in their, in their career as well. So a lot of different perspectives represented here. And one of the things I like to say at the beginning of any talk I give is no one's had to listen to Mark Cicero talk Talk about disasters more than Mark Cicero. So if at any point you have a question and would like to private message Morgan or even just come off mute and shout it out, if anything I say can be added to, needs to be corrected, or uh, resonates with an experience that you've had, uh, please go ahead and share it. If we have a bit of a conversation with, uh, with 30 participants, um, that's great. And I think it's only going to make for a richer discussion. So again, my interests are in pediatrics. And um, I, I have a lot of uh, gratitude to the emergency planners, the EMS clinicians, and EMS leaders who've helped shape my career. When I was a brand new fellow in pediatric emergency medicine, I had the opportunity to design a curriculum for the state of Nevada around getting ready for children in disasters. And at that time, I only knew what I knew, which uh, made me think that any sort of education for disaster should target physicians and nurses. And uh, someone pulled me aside and said, if you really want to make a difference in the response, first, uh, do your best to be sure that we're prepared in the first place. And second, uh, be sure that uh, you focus on folks in the pre-hospital setting, that you focus on the public health workers and uh, ensure that the people who are the real boots on the ground have the equipment and training they need to ensure that children have the best outcomes they can. Because by the time children arrive at a hospital or a physician's office, um, so many opportunities to do a better job for them have already gone by. I, and again, I have no commercial interests um, and my uh, sponsorship by the federal government is listed here. So I'll move forward and, uh, and take a look at uh, what our objectives will be for today's talk. So first of all, um, when we think about children in disasters, um, helping them anticipate what it is that, uh, that they're going to uh, encounter and trying to approximate what happens in their day-to-day -day lives as much as possible uh, is a goal. Our objectives today are to understand what's different and what's the same about children and adult disaster readiness. A lot of this also applies at the other end of the age spectrum. If we think about folks who are toward the ends of their lives, where their health, their ability to make decisions for themselves, their um, ability to flee disaster may look like it does earlier on in life. Um, so we want to know the similarities and differences, and we'll explore those. We'll take a look at scene stabilization and triage, treatment at the scene of the disaster, transport decisions uh, for both natural and human-caused disasters. We'll do some review as far as what is a disaster and, you know, what are the factors that, um, that go into that decision that there's, in fact, a disaster going on or mass casualty incident. And we'll take a look at mass casualty response in the EMS and hospital uh, training and systems testing. And no matter where we are in our careers or what country we practice in, um, there'll be an emphasis here that readying those systems before the disaster happens is often a more fruitful exercise than making decisions on the fly. So we'll make our way forward and talk about types of disasters. Um, you know, a disaster can be a sudden event without too much in the way of warning, uh, a, a no, no awareness, no alert kind of event like a tornado. All the victims uh, may become ill or injured at the same time, and there's some examples listed here. One event that, um, that certainly has been an interest of mine and Morgan Davis, who's one of our hosts for today, uh, is, is leading work here in, uh, in Connecticut, looking at intimate partner violence and the relationship between that and mass shootings here in the United States. And I couldn't help but notice that just over the last few days, that in the states of Oklahoma and Texas, there have been instances of mass gun violence that involved intimate partner violence. These, uh, these sorts of things happen all too frequently in the United States. And let's just take a little look 
at uh, how many mass shooting events there have been in the United States. E just this year, I should say. Each one of these dots represents an instance of four or more people uh, who were injured or killed in mass shootings. Um, and uh, the dots for Oklahoma and, um, and West Texas are represented uh, on this map, as well as the events of Uvalde, Texas. Um, and, uh, and to date, again, there have been more mass shootings than there have been days this year. So a mass shooting and a tornado are very different things, but in planning for them, we recognize that there's very little warning, that there's a test for the system as far as the need to respond to a number of people who've been injured all at once, and that the existing resources are only what they are as far as the number of EMS units, as far as the number of trauma beds, the capabilities of the system. So there can be sudden disasters, and there are those events that have some delay to them, uh, an anticipation of hours or days in the event of a hurricane, uh, and a range of times and presentations as far as degrees of illness or injury. Another example that every single one of us has gone through is the event of a, uh, of a pandemic. And um, with these events, there can be long, long tales as far as the impact on children and others. When we think about the psychological impact of a pandemic or the impact of being displaced from one's home or the loss of home, family, resources, school, community, and the like because of a, of a hurricane, all of these things have a long uh, impact on the community. And people may be ill or injured in the immediate aftermath of the event or in the days, weeks, or even years following the event. So um, all of these events have some things in common as well. We've talked about some fairly disparate events, but what they have in common is they overwhelm the available healthcare resources uh, locally. Earlier, we talked about how at least three continents are represented here. The EMS systems, the various countries that we represent are different. Their readiness to care for children in a disaster are different. And the receiving facilities, the hospitals, the availability of pediatricians, the resources, the shelters, the pediatric specific nutrition needs and, like, and the like all may vary. And that's true within the United States. And that's true even within Connecticut, if we're talking about the area around New Haven or Hartford, where our two children's hospitals are, versus areas that are relatively remote, where there may be community hospitals, the children. The same disaster, like the event seen with this school bus, if it happens in downtown New Haven, will have a different response than if it happens in, say, Sharon, Connecticut, in the northwest corner of our state, where the nearest pediatric trauma centers may be 45 minutes or an hour away. No matter where the disaster happens or what it is or what the pre-existing resources are, children tend to be disproportionately harmed. And it's because of their physical development, their ability to flee, uh, uh, to flee from danger. Uh, if we're talking about a chemical or biological event, their relatively rapid uh, respiratory rate and the fact that um, toxins that are heavier than air sink down to where they are um, more rapidly, there may be certain physical vulnerabilities, certainly emotional vulnerabilities. A child who separated from his or her family um, is uh, more vulnerable than one who's kept with their family. And um, additionally, we need to consider the uh, potential for the impact of poverty. If we're talking about uh, a low-lying area that's on a coast and is likely to be impacted by a hurricane, um, if we think about the events of Hurricane Katrina nearly 20 years ago, um, the areas that were flooded were in low-lying areas. There were a higher proportion of children living there, and um, the the pre-existing condition of poverty is an unfortunate setup for uh, a poor course after uh, the hurricane has uh, been long resolved. As far as not having a home, as far as poor access to health care, as far as uh, school performance, nutrition, and the like. So we talked about that balance of what are the pre-existing resources, whether a person's in rural Vermont or rural Namibia versus if they're in uh, an urban center, the existing resources as far as the personnel to care, 
the EMS resources, the medical equipment, especially pediatric specific equipment, which even here in the United States, we are still uh, working to ensure that hospitals and EMS systems have that appropriately sized equipment, the right medications, operating room space, hospital rooms, and ICU space. And all of that gets balanced against the needs of the patients, their families, their communities, and, uh, and also the need to manage, uh, particularly um, in areas with active media, uh, the need to manage um, the security of the uh, disaster scene and of the receiving hospital. So we work our way through and consider this balance and all of disaster medicine, that may be overly simplistic to say this, is moving this uh, balance to ensure that we get the resources, have the resources and leverage the resources to meet the needs of the patient, the families, and ultimately too, the healthcare workers who are caring for them because uh, there really is a degree of moral hazard and potential uh, long-term uh, emotional and other injury uh, to those who respond to children who've been made very ill and injured in the event of a disaster. I'm gonna pause for a moment and, uh, and note that there's a couple uh, points being made in the chat. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, just um, call out Brandon Scott. Thank you for your comment. Uh, as far as uh, you know, focusing on adults and seldom on children, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, you know, an, an important piece is to bake in the pediatric planning with disaster planning. Uh, with a population of children in the United States, depending on where we're talking about, roughly 20% of the population being pa pediatrics, um, there's a need to plan for children right alongside um, the planning for adults. And we wouldn't want to neglect 20% of the population under any circumstances. And that's why agencies like ASPR um, advocate for regular planning for children in disasters. Thanks for your comment, and please keep the questions and comments rolling. So let's follow a child's course from a small scale MCI and the scene of that MCI through uh, the event. We have a school bus crash that's occurred and that's followed by um, the primary triage of children at the scene, the response from EMS. Let's pause for a moment and talk about EMS. On a day-to-day -day basis, we know, at least in the United States, that children make up maybe 10% of EMS patients, and that may be a bit of a high estimate. And among that 10%, only maybe 10% of those children have uh, a degree of illness or injury that requires interventions on the part of uh, EMS, whether that's the placement of an intravenous line, whether that is airway management, administration of medication or oxygen. So children, especially ill and injured children, uh, truly ill and injured children, are an uncommon occurrence in day-to-day -day emergency medical services. When we combine that fact with an event that doesn't happen all that often, a mass shooting, or tornado. Um, the EMS responders to that event, the law enforcement officers, the first responders, and the lay people on the scene, whatever knowledge and skills they have, whatever equipment they have, are going to be challenged by a low frequency, very high stakes event. So EMS is charged with some very important critical roles in this situation, as far as the primary triage and initial treatment and stabilization. And for those of us who uh, work in the uh, relative luxury of an emergency department, an ICU, a hospital, where our resources can still be overwhelmed, but are really quite deep compared to an EMS unit, uh, I think we need to have a good understanding of the limitations of what um, EMS has on their hands. Really, they're relying on their training, and they're relying on one another as a team, and, uh, and on the system to be ready to receive children. There's initial treatment and stabilization that's done in secondary triage, the decisions about which patients are going to be transported first, particularly when uh, ambulances may be at a premium and there may not be too many units available. And then the goal is for a child to recover from the injury uh, and that we use our resources for those children who are most ill and injured to give them the best chance so that uh, they can go on to ride the bus safely again someday. 
So triage, if so much of disaster medicine can be summarized by that leveraging and that balance between the needs of the patient and the resources that we have available, triage is another nice way to segue into thinking about disaster medicine for all patients and for children. The reason we like to think about it first is that it shows us some of the differences between disaster medicine and day-to-day -day care. Triage and making decisions about who can be treated later, who needs to be treated now, and whose illness or injuries make it so that they're not likely to survive or they're truly not alive anymore. Very different to have one pediatric patient with no vital signs. If that child comes into my emergency department on my next shift, we are going to attempt to resuscitate that child and we'll put forth some significant efforts to try to uh, revive that child, even though um, the likely outcome is, is still that they won't survive. If that child is among 10 or 100 other children who are ill or injured, um, we can't uh, expend resources to try to re resuscitate that child. We need to recognize that, um, that our resources need to be put uh, to children who, who have a chance of survival and need to be cared for now. So triage can impact patient outcomes. Somebody who um, needs to be cared for now and is recognized as a red or priority patient um, and who gets the appropriate timely care has the best chance of survival. Uh, someone who's ambulatory most, most likely can wait and so forth. And it's also good for the population of patients that we think about the application of our resources. Few providers have experience, whether that's uh, EMS clinicians or whether that's emergency physicians, those who've been in the military before may be more likely to have uh, some experience with that. Those who've worked uh, in uh, urban settings or those who've uh, had experiences that uh, have led to the battlefront have certainly had more experience with seeing large number of patients all at once, but few of us have had this experience and the time for training is limited. Uh, every single person on this call today has a number of, of responsibilities, opportunities to learn, and this is a piece of your knowledge that you can apply when uh, you confront a mass casualty situation in the future. We'll move forward and talk about primary triage at the, at the disaster site. So um, patients generally are assigned into one of four color-coded groups. Uh, I won't take the time to talk about the great number of disaster triage systems that are available in the United States and across the world, whether it's triage uh, via trauma sieve, as is used in Australia, whether it's um, the application of the start jumpstart triage here in the United States, or any number of other triage systems that are available, the SALT triage system that's been put forward by the CDC some 15 years ago and is gaining some traction at last. What these systems have in common is making decisions about whether a patient needs immediate care, whether they perhaps are not able to ambulate because of their illness or injury, but their vital signs are relatively stable and they can be cared for on a delayed basis or yellow. A patient who's ambulatory, who gets a green tag, and uh, there's always a bit of a caveat within triage. Somebody might be ambulatory, but have just sustained blast injuries from an explosion. And 10 or 15 minutes later, if we were to revisit them, they may be far less than ambulatory. But triage is an imprecise science. We make decisions about immediate, delayed, ambulatory, or those patients who are truly deceased or not recoverable. Other systems will give an immediate tag, perhaps a gray tag. Um, other systems will use a black or a blue tag to denote somebody who is not likely to survive or uh, is already deceased. And there's no backflow uh, from primary triage once uh, a patient is sorted. So this is review for many uh, on the call, but an important frame just as far as triage and what's different about it compared to day-to-day um, -day care for patients. So the very simplest way that we can sort patients and begin to balance that seesaw or teeter-totter of patient needs and available resources is by saying this. If you can hear me and you're able to move, walk over here. 
If a patient's able to ambulate, then we know a lot about them. They can obey commands, they can perfuse themselves well enough to walk. And um, these green patients may have a number of, um, of resources that can perhaps begin to tip the balance. Maybe one of the ambulatory patients uh, knows CPR. Maybe one of them is somebody with some first aid instruction in the past, and you can ask them to, say, apply pressure to the wound of a different patient. Um, another caveat, though, is the languages that we use may not be the same. So if I say that in English and the patient speaks Spanish, um, there may be a disconnect as far as um, language, or if the event made it so that people can't hear, um, this becomes problematic too. But generally, this phrase and this approach is something that someone doing primary triage can rely on. And then another important thing, no matter what algorithm someone's using, jumpstart, salt triage, et cetera, as soon as you can prioritize or as soon as you can categorize a patient as say red or yellow, or as soon as we see that patient is walking and they get a green tag, there's no need for additional triage. We've done our sorting and um, there's minimal treatment during triage. We might open a patient's airway. We might address life-saving active blood loss with things like tourniquets, junctional tourniquets, or wound packing. Uh, some triage systems um, make the allowance for the use of, uh, of rescue auto injectors or injections uh, for nerve gas. So minimal treatment is done during triage. A chest seal might be given for an open chest wound. I'll take a look at the chat for just a moment and uh, and just kind of pull out a couple of uh, of additional uh, thoughts from from you all. Uh, let's see. Um, thinking about uh, a major issue in Namibia that Brendan points out is moral hazard with EMS services posted on the scene and social media and families see their family members in the emergency before they are even informed, which is very traumatizing for families. That's a great point that calls back the issue of dealing with the media and having a perimeter and also having um, the presence of law enforcement to secure the perimeter. Even then, these sorts of events uh, continue to happen with the ubiquity of phones and uh, the ubiquity of cameras. Um, it, the, I know of no good solution to this particular problem. Although if we talk about EMS services posting uh, from the scene, um, you know, this is my opinion anyway, a, a breach of professionalism that uh, uh, certainly would need to be dealt with afterward. Um, and uh, Karen Ketchy, thank you for your comment regarding triage being a broader term. If we think about events in Haiti or Ukraine or the Philippines, natural disasters or ongoing war, uh, the first actions is to get the ground uh, as far as pediatric capabilities and resources. This is really important from a destination choice. Um, it, National Association of EMS Physicians, as far as day-to-day -day emergencies, we've been taking a look at outcomes for singleton trauma emergencies. And not surprisingly, there was a paper published two years ago, 2021, looking at outcomes as far as mortality for children uh, with high injury severity scores or just, you know, obvious um, uh, severe trauma. Um, and children who went to either pediatric trauma centers or to level one or two trauma centers had better outcomes. Easy to say, but when wide swaths of the United States are uh, and people live in rural settings far from trauma centers or for countries that don't have established trauma systems, um, this information is, is merely a, uh, you know, kind of a call for more organized trauma uh, systems and better uh, preparedness for children in disasters. Um, Zane Grodman, thank you for your comment. Um, as far as patients being ambulatory and triage uh, and Napoleon's uh, army's uh, origin uh, of uh, the triage systems, um, does the underlying philosophy of triage, ambulatory patients still work in the present, especially when triaging children? So the answer is yes with some caveats. Of course, some children are too young to ambulate on their own. If a baby or toddler is 
moving their limbs and they're doing the sorts of things that developmentally we would expect them to be able to do. Or um, if a child isn't moving, not because they can't, but because they're afraid, they're hiding, um, then uh, some evaluation of them with the understanding that we're looking at their vital signs, we're looking to see whether there's any active bleeding or life threats. Um, you know, the answer is yes uh, to the question, but it's more difficult. And it also explains why some EMS clinicians um, have told me in the past that they prefer to give every live child a red tag because they think that child needs a priority to get away from the scene. I'm not advocating for that. What I am saying is, um, you know, that we need to see if the child can walk. We need to see whether they're doing things that are developmentally appropriate. We need to evaluate their vital signs, but not their blood pressure and not taking their pulse because we don't have time for that in triage. We need to see whether they're perfusing appropriately um, with either capillary refill, which can be problematic when it's cold or we're outside, um, or just feeling for a good pulse and seeing if there's appropriate peripheral pulses, period. Um, so few interventions in triage. Kids in triage, as alluded to by the questions in the chat, are more difficult. They don't follow commands. They may hide from rescuers. Injured children might be extricated by parents or adults, and they may be brought to the emergency department or receiving facility or field hospital um, in a way that bypasses EMS. And that may mean that resources aren't used uh, in an ideal manner. We need to recognize that that's just going to happen and that um, still having incident command, having a triage system and making decisions about transport is still the best way to advocate for and ensure that we get the best possible outcomes. Also, uh, like some adults, children may not obey commands. They may not stay put, and they may need distraction to ensure that um, that once they are triaged, they don't wander off and encounter more hazards. So some of the issues with children in triage. More so than others, children are components of their families. If we think about this little girl, and if this is her mother, and her mother might be expecting a baby, and there's perhaps her father and, uh, you know, and then another uh, person with them, um, this family is going to feel so much more secure if they're able to stay together, be transported together, uh, rather than if our school-aged little girl gets transported to a children's hospital or to a different hospital than her parents if they're ill or injured, assuming they need care at all and that they can't be released from the scene. So one important thing to think about is this child's role in her family and how we can either keep families together or reunify them. Whether it is a solution that involves um, uh, QR codes and the tracking of patients, whether it is a photo tracking system has been advocated by Sarita Chung of the Children's Hospital of Boston and other researchers, um, or whether it's a more simple um, you know, uh, bracelet and uh, pen approach to, uh, to tracking patients. I think that uh, to the point that had been made in the chat, having a tracking system for children and deciding what it is prior to the event is more likely to lead to better results than coming up with a solution on the fly and ensuring that we have this child's information, ensuring that if she's allergic to a medication or that if she needs an anti-seizure medicine this evening, if she's going to be separated from her parents by the disaster, that we have that information available for EMS and that EMS is able to convey it uh, to the receiving facility. A lot of this too, I'll admit, is an idealistic kind of pipe dream as far as disaster response, but we're more likely to have it work out if we think about these things systematically and before the event than if we're trying to solve the problems before or after the event has happened. So right now I'm sitting in Connecticut and, um, you know, uh, some members of our team are joining from a little further north than I am here in New Haven. Uh, whether we're in Connecticut, whether we're in Malaysia, anywhere that there's a motorway, we have the potential for a mass casualty event. And if we can think about a family with two parents and three children 
who are on a motorway in New Britain, Connecticut. There's a crash. The parents have bruises. The father has a broken forearm. The younger two children, the one and the three-year-old, have no obvious injuries. And the seven-year-old, his breathing, has a hematoma of the scalp and is unresponsive. So far, there's one ambulance. What transport issues do you foresee as far as um, the management of the most injured child, which I, I'm sure we'll all agree is the seven-year-old, and, uh, and what sort of strategies would you use uh, to ensure that this child is transported safely and that, uh, you know, that there's a member of the family who perhaps can provide a medical history to the receiving hospital. We'll open that up to the chat or if anyone would like to come off mute and discuss that. Uh, I'm just curious what strategy you would use in thinking about transport of this child. What would the ideal transport destination be and how will you keep this family uh, together and what ways will you uh, decide about that use of that first ambulance? Hey, this is Karen. Uh, I, I can give it a go. Um, Thank you. If this is the only ambulance that's going to arrive on scene, um, then I would take the entire family to the closest hospital that can care for the pediatric patient who seems to be most acute at this point. Um, you know, the parents having uh, bruises and a forearm fracture that can be easily cared for. Um, the seven-year-old is the one who has the most crisis and uh, they could be all stabilized there and then distributed out to a different hospital uh, if needed down the line. That would be my immediate approach if I was the uh, paramedic on scene. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable use of resources. You think about the destination uh, being a facility that's able to care for this child that has a significant head injury. Uh, you know, everyone else, if they were to wait hours or days, you know, they'll probably uh, be just fine. But we have real concerns about this seven-year-old. Um, and uh, any other thoughts from among the participants, other ways to approach this? Um, hi, my name is Lee, a uh, pediatrics resident in Miami. I think um, we don't know that the parents have, whether they have any further injuries. So I might want to go to a trauma center that can also um, evaluate the parents as well as, of course, uh, the baby or the seven-year-old, sorry. Yeah. No, thank you. That's a good point, too. Um, primary pr uh, triage um you know, corresponds reasonably well with outcomes, but you're right that these bruises may be, um, you know, uh, only the tip of the iceberg and there may be some bleeding or some other injuries that uh, will uh, make themselves known. Um, I'm noticing in the chat that my friend and colleague, Pat Frost, points out that the New York Pediatric Disaster Coalition modified the recommendations uh, to have all injured infants be read regardless of condition a few years ago uh, as a high priority uh, population. And I, I'm picking out the word injured, all injured infants. Um, I, I wonder if there was any more uh, specificity there. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of counterbalancing that with Brendan Scott's uh, insightful uh, you know, uh, comment that triage is triage regardless of age. Over triage is not beneficial to providing effective care um, to those in need of overflowing receiving facilities. Um, the event that we're talking about here um, with five patients um, is different than, say, during the triple demic surge of viruses or the worst uh, days of the pandemic, for example. Um, but uh, I'm curious what others have to say. I, I have opinions to share uh, regarding uh, balancing the triage is triage versus the New York coalition's uh, change that any injured infant be given a red tag. But I'm curious what others on the call have to have to say about that. And so Brendan, I'm also Shana. Seeing... Yeah, go ahead, Shana, please. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, you know, I think a lot of it depends on the capability of who's caring and the amount of people to be triaged. If you have an infant that you have a really good history, probably sustained no impact or injury, 
uh, you know, nicely buckled into a car seat, that kind of thing. Maybe it was a 12 card pileup. They were in the last car, minimal impact. I think I wouldn't necessarily, and now granted, would you call them injured or not? I suppose, you know, maybe they got a scratch or something like that. And, but you have a hundred other pe people on scene. I think that stretches your capabilities a little bit different than if it's a family and they have one infant and maybe one or two other children and then parents. Right. Disasters are so situational as far as the number of resources that are available, the destinations, the capabilities of those destinations. Um, I think that going back to the tenets of triage and thinking about, you know, does this patient have uh, any respiratory distress? Does this child have a secure airway? Um, or do they have a reliable airway, I should say? Are there respiratory issues? Is there any sign of uh, shock or circulatory compromise? And what's this child's mental status? If we work our way through all that and there's no sign of um, any problems that would make the child a, a category red, then I might advocate for, I would advocate for not making them a category red because there's only so many resources that are available. Um, we may need to have someone whose responsibility it is to supervise the infants and toddlers and children, and that can be problematic in its own right. I'm going to take a look at the chat as well, uh, and I'm seeing, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm seeing some degree of almost consensus here as far as difficulty with uh, fitting five people in an ambulance. Brendan Scott saying, where there's a will, there's a way and a challenge, and uh you know, if that seven-year-old needs any resuscitation, having five people packed in the back may be an issue. So thank you for your thoughts regarding this case. Uh, you know, when we think about disasters, this sort of event may not be the one that comes to mind, but the, uh, depending on the available resources and where we are in the world, it truly may overwhelm those resources. So preserving the family re, uh, unit and when possible, transporting the family to the receiving facility together um, helps us avoid a lot of problems as far as anxiety and uh, uh, difficulty for all of the family members as far as uh, not needing to track um, patients who are separated from their families and, um, and also the provision of uh, medical history uh, by family members for children who can't provide that for themselves. All right, uh, the next chunk of our, of our talk, and I'm recognizing that uh, that we've spent a good amount of our time together already, but now we're going to talk about a bit of a U.S. centric uh, approach that may have some concepts that are either mirror or are useful elsewhere in the world. Um, and the idea, this is the idea of trauma centers, and trauma centers are designated by the states where they uh, are uh, located, and the American College of Surgeons verifies the abilities, capabilities of a trauma center. What a trauma center is, is a um, designated uh, receiving hospital that has the ability to care for either injured adults, injured children, or in some cases, both. Um, and when we think about a level three trauma center, admittedly, there are levels uh, five and uh, four as well. Um, basically, the lower the number, the more capable the trauma center is. So we'll jump in by talking about level three centers, which have the resources for emergency resuscitation, surgery, and intensive care for most trauma patients. Importantly, they have an agreement with level one or level two centers uh, for transport of patients who need uh, additional care and stabilization or perhaps surgical subspecialty uh, services. And uh, here in Connecticut, for those that are based in Connecticut, Bacchus Hospital is an example. A level two center has more comprehensive trauma care with the uh, capability of 24-hour surgical subspecialty care, for example, orthopedics or neurosurgery or vascular surgery, um, and also the personnel and equipment to render that care. What's different about a level two facility compared to a level one is that a level two facility does not necessarily have a surgery residency or research program. And uh, locally, Stanford Hospital is an example for those who are uh, near me. And finally, a level one has comprehensive trauma care similar to level two. 
24 hour availability of all the services, and also has a surgery residency and a trauma research program. Um, and an example locally in Connecticut is uh, St. Francis Hospital, which is in Hartford. So a question, whether you're in Connecticut or anywhere in the world is, what about children? In the event of a disaster or in the event of a, of a badly injured child, what hospitals have the capability to care for ill and injured children? I'm talking to you from uh, one of our nation's smallest states and uh, you know, in pretty dense in population. However, there are only two out of our 30 or so acute hospitals that are trauma centers for children. And you can see their locations here. Um, if we think about a trauma center, and its readiness for children in disasters, this table, whether you are making a decision about a hospital getting ready for children in disasters, an EMS, uh, an EMS agency that's preparing, or if you're a group of students who are interested in disaster readiness, uh, this table may prove useful and it's helpful for me as well when I'm trying to achieve goals in disaster education in thinking about how much time do I have, what are my goals, and how active is this going to be. Right now we're doing a seminar with uh, perhaps some elements of a uh, workshop with some small group um, planning and uh, some degree of, uh, of conversation. If we were to sit around a table, uh, and think about the response to, say, a school bus crash, there'd be more planning involved uh, and more interaction among all of us. And as we work our way all the way out to functional exercises and full-scale exercises, as um, was done in the southwest of the United States recently and thinking about the response to an earthquake, um, there's more realism, more interaction, and more planning involved. So when we think about all of those different trauma center levels as they prepare for children in disasters, the idea might be frequent use of things like seminars, workshops, or even just huddles where people put their heads together and say, if we had 10 critically injured children come in today because of a mass shooting, what would we change about our day-to-day -day practice? What additional resources would we need? What protocols exist? And how can we improve those protocols? Um, and a trauma center or a critical access hospital or um, a, a health uh, maintenance organization might think about doing an operational-based test further on toward our rights as we look at the screen, um, at least on an annual basis, and think about incorporating the needs of children and adults and the entire population um, in readying for disasters. Just like pediatric triage is more complicated, pediatric exercises tend to be more complicated. Um, children have different needs and they may uh, present to those who don't typically care for children, um, meaning that a disaster doesn't obey the boundaries of where the trauma center is. Um, and the ill and injured children may uh, present in a place that's far from the, the trauma center. Um, there's a need to ensure that we can treat unaccompanied children and understand the regulations that go with that. Uh, and then identifying and reuniting children with their families, planning for times when pediatricians need to care for adult patients and vice versa. Early on in the pandemic, particularly in March and April of 2020, um, you know, many of my colleagues who are pediatricians cross-trained and cared for uh, severely ill adults. And um, you know, we can imagine a time when children might be particularly injured and might or ill and might outnumber uh, the adults who are ill and injured where our adult colleagues uh, are able to flex and, uh, and care for children. We need to think about access and appropriate use of pediatric equipment and being sure that it's ready and um, also be ready for the mental and behavioral health issues that say, for example, continue to stem from the time of the pandemic. So here's an example of a facilitator. See if he looks familiar to you as you look at the image. 
who's uh, working with a multidisciplinary group that includes nurses, social workers, chaplains, and uh, surgeons, and emergency physicians who are aiming to care for um, an influx of patients during a, a live drill. Uh, these sorts of exercises are pretty resource intense and require the buy-in of a large group of people. They have the advantages of, uh, of realism, but the disadvantage of all those resources that need to go into their delivery. Uh, if we think about disaster huddles, the sort of simulation that doesn't involve patients, but it's an opportunity to, in real time, think about what resources we're going to bring to bear for a disaster. Games and tabletop exercises or distributed learning like video games and virtual uh, reality. These won't necessarily replace live simulations and the like, but they can augment what we do and keep us sharp and ready to think about the needs of a large number of patients coming in all at once. Um, our exercises test the plan and also show us where the holes in the plan and the opportunities for improvement may be. A disaster exercise that occurs on a tabletop might be a pr uh, preparation for a more complex and more involved exercise, or might be the means to the end uh, in itself if we're looking to at how stakeholders work together and looking to bring together groups that don't necessarily talk to each other frequently. Say, for example, public health workers with EMS, with uh, children's hospitals. And it's an opportunity, too, to train with new equipment, new protocols, or communication options. Um, one freely available resource that I encourage anyone who's interested in disaster planning uh, to uh, take a look at and see if it's a good fit for your needs is the 15 till 50 mass casualty incident uh, toolkit. This is a way for hospitals to think about their plan when there's an anticipated surge of roughly 50 patients to be coming to the hospital in 15 minutes. Uh, it includes staff roles, job sheets, it in, includes uh, descriptions of the patients, and it uses the Hospital Incident Command System, or HICS. It's uh, in wide use here in the United States and elsewhere. So that's one resource that's worth reading about and perhaps using uh, either now or in your future disaster planning. One thing that we in our group at Yale have used frequently has been live simulations and the depiction of disaster survivors by actors and mannequins at the same time. Uh, Morgan Davis is doing similar work at this time, and there's some real advantages here in simulating reality. There's hands-on skill practice. There's the opportunity to debrief and learn together in real time. But the limitations are everyone needs to be in the same room at the same time. And there are certain schedule constraints that go with this as well. Uh, live simulations are often, but not always, a, a good choice to meet our goals and objectives for disaster learning. Um, we need to think about the needs of adult learners, uh, present company included, as far as uh, whether it's applicable to real life, whether the teacher is serving as a guide, uh, whether there's an experience that's more likely to stick with a person uh, rather than uh, simply facts that are being presented, and um, whether there's opportunity for discussion and learning. Uh, some members of this call have had the opportunity to participate in the Project ECHO sessions that have been put forth first by the University of New Mexico and now are in wide use. The model there is all teach and all learn. Um, and the assumption here is we all have experiences, we all want to do well, and we all want to do an even better job than we have in the past. That approach to disaster learning works well and can ensure that, uh, that our systems, that our personnel, that our equipment, that uh, our whole plan is built as well as it can be before the disaster to ensure the best outcomes for children, for families, for communities. So in conclusion, pediatric planning and response is part of most disasters and MCIs. Children are part of the population rather than an annex or an appendix to be um, added to the disaster plan as a footnote. It's 20% of the population that's pediatric and 100% that's um, connected to children in some way or another. 
and educational methods can be used to improve disaster readiness. And thankfully, there's a growing body of information coming from Wadham and other researchers that uh, you know show this to be true. I really appreciate your attention today. And I think we have a little time for, uh, for questions if there are any. Thank you all. Um, just as people are becoming, uh, preparing to come off mic, there is one question from the chat from Roxanne. And she wants to know if there's any video games or virtual reality or other um, like training immersion tools that you would recommend. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for that question, Roxanne. I appreciate it. Uh, there is um, a virtual reality disaster learning tool that's uh, come from uh, MDA. Uh, what is it? Magan uh, David Adam, which is the uh, Israel-wide um, EMS service that involves virtual reality. Uh, and um, it is a way to um, model individual patient emergencies as well as mass casualties. Um, as far as other virtual reality offerings in pediatrics, uh, the pre-hospital emergency care course uh, or, um, that's offered by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, in its most recent version has partnered with uh, a virtual reality education firm. Uh, so that course uh, is um, involves virtual reality. Uh, our group has put together a uh, a video game, uh, an image from it is here on the screen right now, 60 Seconds to Survival. Uh, 60 Seconds to Survival is free. It's a video game and uh, has had about 35,000 users at this point. Um, uh, take a look at all of these resources. Other people on, on the call may have other resources that they'd advocate for, uh, but 60 Seconds to Survival is freely available. And um, all of these can either serve as a way to augment the learning for your learners, or uh, can serve as a primary way for people to learn and then do kind of a flipped classroom model where people then discuss what they've learned um, at, as a group after the fact. Great, I don't see any more in the chat. So if anyone wants to drop any new information or uh, come off mic, we'd we would love to hear any thoughts or questions you all have. Dr. Cesaro, I just wanted to hop on and thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, I'm a third year medical student and I've done my pediatric um, clinical rotation. And even within that, and perhaps it's my, my clinical training site, we didn't have a huge focus on emergency pediatrics. It was very much clinic based. So I think it's great um, to have you here and give us some exposure because something that we try to do within our student young professional special interest group is get exposure for students, anyone in, in um, the learning stages or early in their career, exposure to these things so that they can have some more vocabulary around it and they can have these resources in case they wanna do independent learning or like use it as a stepping stone. So thank you for supplementing our knowledge in that way. This has been really helpful. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity, yeah. Um, as far as for those who are early in their career and considering um, career choices, um, pediatric emergency medicine, depending on your medical school or your nursing or, um, or paramedic school, may not be a large facet of your education. Uh, I'll speak personally and then provide a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, data. Uh, I've been very satisfied in my career. It, it, having children who are coming in with problems that can be fixed um, and uh, being able to take care of them to alleviate their pain and suffering and to help them leave the emergency department better is very satisfying. Working as part of a team that cares for children who need um, longer term care um, with a goal of improving their health overall is, is also really gratifying. 
And uh, pediatric emergency medicine has been a career that uh, has exposed me to all kinds of opportunities uh, to work with others within healthcare. It has given me real appreciation for EMS. So, um, oh, and here's that fact that I wanted to share, which is, um, you know, there was a uh, you know fairly well conducted survey of various uh, physicians in disciplines across healthcare, and the group with the greatest amount of job satisfaction and happiness. Uh, we're pediatric emergency physicians. There are challenges, and that's true in any career. But um, you know, it, it's it's certainly worth a look for those who are interested in disasters and emergency medicine and uh, in the day to day care of uh, of a group that uh, that certainly will benefit from your time and talents. Question, please. Um, could we take a couple of minutes to? Uh talk to Brandon regarding behavioral health. In, I'm an American uh, EMS physician. So in the hospital, we have our behavioral health professionals who can take care of staff and families. In our domestic preparedness program, we also talk about the unification centers. Uh, Brandon Scott, um, is in the chat, and he's been asking questions regarding, I think, critical instinct stress management, debriefing, defusing, uh, and how we plan, how we write our plans for and include behavioral health. I think it's very important, especially in pediatric trauma. I mean, uh, every time we run a pediatric code, we, do, we don't get debriefed. Would, right. but we, we don't we might defuse but we don't get, have a debriefing uh when we talk about mass casualties we we've, we've, we speak about it every week now here in the u.s but uh to i'd like to hear from brandon i wonder if he can demute and i think i'm muted can you hear me william yes thank you very nice to meet you brandon nice to meet you william I agree with what you say there, and the problem we face in Namibia is, in total, we have only got five psychiatrists in the whole of Namibia. Um, we don't have many counselors. Debriefs are almost non-existent. So there was a German student here. She did her thesis on uh, behavioral problems and uh, mental health for the EMS. And Germany is basically going to assist in Namibia because Namibia used to be a colony of Germany. Mm. So they're the only ones that have reached out to actually offer any assistance. But we don't have that official counseling or debriefing that's run by professionals. It's usually persons like myself, the, the older generation paramedics that would usually do that. Here we have, I attended, Je Jeff Mitchell uh, was a paramedic in Baltimore, and I attended the International Center for, for, for Critical Incident Stress Management in Baltimore, maybe 1992. Uh, but that's something you might want to look at, critical incident stress management, and uh, I don't know what you do for telepsychiatry either. We, we we try to leverage telepsychiatry in this country. And and again, we don't have enough people who practice under the umbrella of psychiatric emergency medical systems. This is something that we need, something that all developing and developed countries need. And that's a topic for another uh, another Zoom with the young professionals. But psychiatric emergency medical systems doesn't receive enough attention. You know, we um, so every oh by the way, the Wadham has a psychosocial section or special interest group that you might want to plug into just so you can network with other professionals. So I think we're going beyond time. Any comments? 
I was going to drop this in, in the chat, but um, there is, this isn't a complete solution by any means, but there is, uh, for the initial management of patients, uh, there's a tool called SciStart that was put forward by uh, Merit uh, Chip Schreiber. Uh, and, um, and actually, I will put that in, in the uh, um the comments so that you can you can see it. It can be useful for initial triage from a behavioral and psychological uh, standpoint in disasters. Um, and uh, I, I like the suggestion uh, that you had made, William, regarding um, the uh, the use of telepsychiatry. And um, and thankfully, it is a discipline that lends itself well to um, to virtual presence, uh, especially in a place that may have so few uh, psychiatrists, as we just heard uh, in, in Namibia. I mean, with tele telemedicine, in, in this country, we, we're using more telemedicine from the emergence room um, to, to receive guidance with various types of uh, head injuries as well, head injuries, stroke, et cetera. So something that can be leveraged, something that can be explored. So thank you for the time. I agree, William. Um, we do have some of the psychiatrists, ah, oh, sorry, psychologists that are willing to do online counseling, which has made it very easier or much easier for some of the EMS personnel that work with me to be able to see someone without having to take time off or it's also a cheaper method because you don't have to drive there and sit around and And do you have police psychologists where you are too? Does your does your law enforcement and military utilize psychologists for critical incidents? Did we lose you? I believe we may have. Um, just unless anyone has any additional comments, I just to wrap things up a little bit. Um, I posted the link in our chat. I'll do. I'll post it again. Um, this is to how to stay involved in our Wadham group and the specifically the student young professional special interest group. Um, so first of all, really thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Cicero, for presenting today. Um, and for any of you that are involved with the, in academics and um, believe there may be an interest in um, creating a Wadham organization or a Wadham club um, at your university or at your um, whatever program you're affiliated with, definitely reach out to us. That's something we could assist with. Um, and then also if you, anyone has any future ideas for um, upcoming events, we'd love to hear them. We're always looking for uh, the next guest speaker. So. Uh, Morgan, Alana, Dr. Cicero, unless you have anything else, I want to just thank everyone again for coming. Yeah, um, just to echo what Andrew said, thank you so much for all your time and the discussion. Um, definitely sign up for our form if you want to keep in touch. And then I'll also be at Congress. So if anyone else will be there, please be don't be a stranger and say hi. Um, and that looks like that's everything. Thank you so much for joining and have a lovely rest of your day.